Hello again, my name is Kai, uh, and welcome to Wildlife Sounds today, uh, and it's the bird edition. Like I said, we're doing gray, so I like to have a color theme for every day to help me choose birds, because there's so many to choose from, and there's so many that I like. Um, but yeah, today's gray. So let's go ahead and dive in. I'll show the habitat where you'll find this bird, and I'll play uh, the recording of the call. So feel free to post um, uh, what you think it might be, or you can just wait for me to reveal it. So. Let's do this. Okay, so for this one, so this is typically the habitat you'll find it in within a city. So this could be like an urban park or arboretum. And then you'll hear that Peter, Peter, Peter call. So that mnemonic that uh, we heard about before. So Peter, Peter, Peter. So I'll play it again so you can hear that. All right, so I will do the grand reveal now. It is a tufted titmouse. So yeah, again, if you hear that Peter, Peter, Peter within the city, if you're just walking around, this is what you're gonna hear. This tiny little uh, bird, gray bird, has white and then a little like brown orange on the side. So one of my favorite birds because they're so like little and cute uh, and they're everywhere around here for the most part. So you go to any park and you'll primarily hear this little Peter Peter call. Um, so yeah, let's learn some more about the tufted titmouse. So like I said, uh, first of all, the song, so that's what we're listening for here is the song, not necessarily the call, just like we learned before. Uh, and that's primarily what I like to focus on in these as well. However, with the blue jay that I talked about before, that was more of a call. But for these, with the songbirds, we're primarily going to learn about the songs. So the Peter, 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 that's constantly going to be repeated over and over again. Uh, it's whistled series about four to eight times, four to eight notes. Um, so that's what you're going to be hearing. So diving into the behavior and life history. Uh, so the tough to tip, tip mouse, uh, or you can just call it a tip mouse. That's what I like to call it. Uh, they flit around from branch to br branch um, in the forest canopy looking for food. They're pretty acrobatic uh, when they're foraging. They can hang upside down or sideways or even float for a little bit while they're looking for insects, uh, looking on the other undersides of branches and leaf clusters and stuff like that. They can also be found hopping around on the ground looking for uh, seeds and insects as well. So they're pretty, they can be pretty easy to find depending on where you're at. Um, and when they find large seeds, they actually will hold them in their, um, in their uh, feet and then they'll hammer at them to get them open. And then from there, they've been known to even store them in like wood crevices and, and bark crevices uh, to get through like winter and things like that. Um, so they're very vocal birds too. So like I said, you'll hear that Peter, Peter, Peter pretty often and pretty recognizably. Um, and they respond and they're very curious to like other sounds of agitation from other birds. And they'll join in on uh, a mob of a predator. So they're they're definitely down for a fight if as long as there's others also fighting away predators. So uh, I think that's pretty interesting too for their behavior. Um, they're fun little birds, like I said. Uh, so in terms of their diet, they eat mainly insects, like I said, especially in the summer. Uh, one thing that I really love about them is that they eat stink bugs as well. Um, and stink bug is an invasive species, so they're really hard to get rid of. And in my previous apartment, I had them all the time, and I'm like, I need something that eats these. So uh, the tip mice will actually eat stink bugs, so I appreciate that. Uh, so they eat other insects and bugs as well. Um, and then these insects can make up to two thirds of their diet annually, uh, but they also eat seeds and nuts and berries um, and acorns and things like that. Uh, and then experiments had even shown that they will choose the larger nuts, like primarily all, all the time. So that's really interesting too. All right, so in terms of their habitat, you can see it here. So this is their year round habitat. Um, so, you know, Kentucky is right in the midst of it. So that's where you're gonna find them year round all the time. Um, so they live in deciduous woods, mixed evergreen deciduous woods. Uh, they like dense canopy and many tree species to be represented. 
Uh, they're common in orchards and parks uh, in suburban areas if the trees are large enough. Uh, they're generally found in low elevations, though. You don't really find them above like 2,000 feet in elevation. All right, so in terms of conservation and threats, uh, so like I said, they're really common, especially in these areas, and the population has actually increased uh, from 1966 to 2019. Uh, estimated population about 12 million. Uh, so it's a species of low conservation concern, which is which is good. Um, and their range has been expanding northward over the last half century uh, for various reasons. One can be global climate change as well. They're just moving a little bit more north. Um, then also farmlands reverting to forests uh, and glowing, the growing popularity of backyard bird feeders too, as they're moving more northward. Um, so then lastly, we can dive into a little fun facts for it. Um, so uh, tit mice, they like to nest in tree holes and they can't actually excavate their own like tree holes. So they'll use these natural hole cavities that are left by like woodpeckers and stuff. Um, and they very much depend on dead wood as well for their homes. So that's one reason why it's important to allow dead wood to remain in forest uh, for these, but also just regular forest ecosystem purposes. Uh, but this is one animal, uh, one organism that can benefit from uh, downed and dead uh, wood. Um, so also uh, they like to uh, line the inner cup of their nest with hair. So they can even pluck the hair from actual living animals. And there's like a list of hair types that come from raccoons, opossums, mice, woodchucks, squirrels, rabbits, livestock, pets, and even humans. So watch your head. There might be some tip mice coming to steal your hair. Um, so on to the next one. So this is primarily going to be the habitat that you'll find it. Um, they're pretty well found in... Um, urban settings as well. Uh, so yeah, let's go ahead and listen for the first time. Oops. Well, I revealed it, but I will have you go ahead and listen to it. So, um, oh, I see there's a chat as well. Oh no, <laughs> that's not good, yeah. Watch out for your dogs, too, because they'll chase them, apparently, and try to get their hair. But yeah, so this mnemonic for the Eastern Phoebe, so this worked out pretty well. It's pretty easy to hear and recognize, and I feel like I would have given it away. So the mnemonic for this one is Phoebe, Phoebe. So it kind of announces its name in what it's saying. So that's easy to remember. And I guess it knew what I was going to do anyway, because um, I would have revealed the name. So uh, let's listen to it again. Okay, there we go. All right, so yeah, hopefully you heard that little Phoebe, Phoebe, and then sometimes they'll have that little flitter too, that Phoebe. So yeah, that's going to be what you'll hear for Eastern Phoebe. So that's also a pretty recognizable one that you'll hear as well. Every now and then that one will stand out when I'm out doing field work and I'm like, oh, there's a Phoebe, that's pretty cool. So those two are some pretty easy ones to recognize if they, they, they tend to stand out in all the bird calls that are going, all the bird songs that are going. Um, so let's learn some more about them. Uh, so they also make like a sharp peep call as well. And uh, in addition to their familiar Phoebe song. Um, so in terms of their behavior and life history, uh, so they generally like to perch low in trees or on fence lines. So they can be pretty easy to spot and find, relatively speaking. Um, and they stay alert as they prepare to go after flying insects. And then when they spot a flying insect, they'll abruptly like go after them with quick wing beats and chase down their prey in a quick trip as they return right back to the perch or a similar area. Um, and very often do they hover and pick insects or seeds from foliage. They typically will perch and just watch and wait and then go after them, which I haven't seen uh, in real life, but I would imagine that would be pretty cool. Um, haven't been birding in a while, but I think that would be one thing that I would love to watch and see. 
Uh, so when perched, uh, these Phoebes like to wag their tails up and down frequently too. So that's kind of a cool thing to see. Uh, they rarely occur in groups. They're pretty solitary, even with mated pairs. They, um, they're not around each other super often, super frequently. Uh, they spend little time together. And the males will sing uh, that two-part raspy song throughout spring and aggressively uh, uh, defend their territory. Um, and the females primarily, both sexes, but primarily females will defend against predators like snakes and jays and crows and things like that. Uh, so they are among the earliest of migrants, bringing hope that spring is here. So that's kind of cool. Once you start hearing them, uh, you can know that spring's on its way. Um, and then they're also one of the later migrants to leave the area, too. And I'll talk about when they come here and when they leave a little bit later. Um, in terms of their diet, like I said, they like flying insects, and that makes up primarily the majority of their diet. Um, and one thing that I like about them in particular is that they, they eat ticks and I hate ticks. I have not had one latch on me, knock on wood, and I hope that I can keep it that way. And the Phoebe, I appreciate them for eating ticks. So two birds that I appreciate for what they eat. Um, and then they also eat small fruits and berries, um, especially in the cooler months. And that's uh, a large part of their winter diet. Um, so diving into their habitat. Uh, they tend to favor more open woods, such as yards and parks and woodlands, farms, stream sides, woodland edges, which is interesting for a migratory bird. You typically don't see that for migratory birds, but they typically like the more open areas. Um, they breed around areas with ideal nesting sites, which can include uh, wooded areas um, and then also human built structures like the eaves of buildings and overhanging decks and bridges and culverts. So that's kind of interesting that they started to utilize this urban setting. Um, so we can see that in their nesting uh, behavior. Um, and before these sites were common, uh, they nested in bare rock outcrops and they still do occasionally depending on where they are. All right, in terms of their migration, you can see it uh, up here is gonna be their, um, their fall, um, spring, spring to fall migration. Uh, and then this is their breeding ground in the purple. And then this is non-breeding wintering area down below. Um, so uh, like I said, they favor open woods. Um, they're hardy birds too. And so they winter farther north than most, most other flycatchers. So typically um, this wintering range will be much lower and down into even South America but they go as low as the uh, Southern US into Mexico, which is still pretty northward, relatively speaking. So that's pretty interesting. And like I said, they're the earliest returning migrants in the spring and sometimes as early as March. Um, so they can be like one of the first that you might hear uh, in the springtime. So they're short to medium distance migrants. They migrate south in September to November range. So this was a perfect bird to choose for August because by this time, most birds either have left or on their way out. But this one still lingers around September to November. So get out there and listen for the Phoebe if you can. That's another migratory bird that you can listen to for a little bit and practice for these last few months before March. And then you'll be an expert by then. Um, so let's see, going to conservation and threats. Uh, so the use of buildings and bridges for the nest sites has allowed the Phoebe to uh, tolerate the landscape changes made by humans and expand its range. So that's kind of interesting. Uh, a lot of bird species are being negatively affected by human uh, interaction and urbanization and things like that. But uh, this bird has learned to utilize those for its benefit. Um, however, it still uses the natural nest sites if it can and if they're available. Uh, so the populations have increased slightly from 1966 to 2019, and estimated population is about 35 million. So again, another species of low conservation concern, which is good. More ticks being eaten, which I appreciate. Um, and then historically, Phoebe's uh, increased as uh, people spread across the landscape. Um, and built structures that these birds could use. So again, that's this is a good example of how urbanization can benefit wildlife species, but that's not the case for all wildlife species, unfortunately. Um, and then lastly, diving into some fun facts, 
One fun fact, um, in 1804, the Eastern Phoebe became the first banded bird in North America, which is pretty wild to imagine the first bird to be uh, banded. So John James Audubon uh, attached the um, thread to Eastern Phoebe and watched it to return um, in successive years. So just a little fun fact for you, but that is everything for today for Wildlife Sound. So thank you for joining in, listening and learning.